All right, just revising that idea of the poem as a picture and the poem as a balance of opposites and the poem as a voice. Uh, let's go through this with Adrian Mitchell's poem, To Whom It May Concern. Uh, we, we know the poem reasonably well by now, so I won't read it. I won't read it all through. Um, <clears throat> I'll assume that you, you're, you're familiar with the poem. There are lots of other... That's, that's my email sounding off. Uh, there are lots of other things that we can talk about the poem, um, and we'll come back perhaps later on to think about techniques as they work through poetry, but uh, people notice that, that second person, you know, you, know, you, you, put, you put your bombers in, you put your bombers out, you take the human being and you twist it all about. This is a slightly different topic before I move on, but have you thought about that? Have you thought about, you see, to me, this connects with some other topic, another topic which we'll be moving on to, which is intertextuality. Our texts connect with other texts. Our five ways to kill a man connects with the Bible. All right? You need to know the story of the cock that crows and the man that was nailed to a piece of wood in order to understand um, five ways to kill a man. In order to get the full feeling of this poem, there's something you, you need to know. You put your left foot in, you put your left foot out, you do the hokey cokey and you shake it all about. And that's what it's all about. Wow. Okay, he takes a funny little dance song and changes it to, you put your bombers in, you put your bombers out. You take the human being and you twist it all about. Oh, shh. Sure. Okay? It really gets you when you know the intertextuality of it, when you realize what it connects with. Okay? And there are so many, it's not just that little bit, but this whole thing of adding to scrub my skin with women, chain my tongue with whiskey, stay stuff my nose, nose with garlic. There are so many um, children's rhymes that follow that kind of pattern. It was an old lady who swallowed a fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. It was an old lady who swallowed a spider. That wriggled and wriggled and wriggled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she died. It was an old lady who swallowed a, a bird. <laughs> well, that's absurd. She swallowed a bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider. That wriggled and wriggled and wriggled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she died. And it goes on and on and on into something bigger each time, okay? Until there was an old lady who swallowed a horse. She's dead, of course. Okay? But it builds up each time, one line, and it's following that same children's nursery rhyme pattern. Again, it's shocking, because it's not anything like but a uh, children's nursery rhyme. Okay? So uh, that's going to be something else that we're going to start looking at later on. Various ways of poetic technique, various ways of... In it connecting texts with other texts, um, playing around with genres and things like that to gain effects, because that's something we need to notice. How do poets get their effects? But the three basic ones that I want us to focus on and get very clear right from the beginning are the, the voice, the pictures, and the ba balance of opposites. It, doesn't, it can be in any order. Um, so I'm starting off with the voice here. To whom it may concern is like one of those business letters that people write, okay? Because we don't know who's going to receive it. So uh, it gives it a sort of anonymous, you know, kind of oshibase. Uh, I can't remember the Japanese expression for this, but there's a, you do it in Japanese letters when you don't know who's getting the letter. So to whom it may concern. And then, of course, we notice that the word concerned means, you know, I, I'm concerned. So it's also written to somebody who may be concerned. Look at Barack Obama looking concerned there. All right. Uh, it may concern him. It may concern you or me when we see it. it may, anybody may be concerned. <laughs> thought you might like that one. Uh, uh, these people are concerned. Okay. Are we concerned when we read this poem? in that sort of way. Well, I think probably by now we are a bit. 
it has affected us in a certain way once we've realized what we're saying. So you've got the ordinary person, okay? Uh, I was run over by the truth one day. Speaking, saying this, and as we noticed, you know, who is that? Who is it? I mean, this person's, you know, this is us wondering, who is it that was run over by the truth one day? What, who, who are we talking about here? Okay? Uh, where does this voice come from? And what I tried to impress on you at the time, and I hope you've got the message, was don't make things complicated for yourself. These words are spoken by, and the answer is the very basic, the very simple answer. These words are well, it's spoken by someone who was run over by the truth. No mysteries here. Don't give yourself mysteries. Don't make it complicated. The simple answer is the right answer. And that's the problem. Very often, we are too complicated. It's not that poetry is too complicated. We are too complicated to understand it. We think, well, it can't be that simple. That sounds almost cheeky to so, you know, see it so simply. But that's the, the, very often the best way to do it. Tell me lies about Vietnam. Again, these words are spoken by someone who wants to be told lies about Vietnam. Keep it simple. That way you don't go running, round, running down the wrong path and making wrong suppositions um, uh, you know, about what's going on in the text. Next thing, uh, the balance of opposites in the poem. Okay, we've got lies and truth. Okay, and normally we would think of truth as being positive and lies as being negative. But the way it works out in this poem uh, is, you know, not what we'd normally expect, with truth uh, positive and lies negative, uh, but the poet actually says prefers lies. He prefers lies. Tell me lies about Vietnam. So it twists the normal supposition on its head, and uh, truth becomes the negative thing, and lies become the positive thing. Okay? Of course, you know, that brings us back to the voice. As our, you know, Does he really mean it? Okay? Yeah, how ironic is this? Uh, but the point is that the truth hurts. Okay, and then finally, uh, it's just a short presentation, this one. Uh, finally, the poem as a picture. Scrub my skin with women. We've got all these pictures going on, okay? Uh, chain my tongue with whiskey, all right? We can see these things pretty clearly. Stuff my nose with garlic. All right, coat my eyes with... I couldn't find any... Anything with any, any pictures on the internet with people with butter on their eyes, so I, 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 I photoshopped myself there. Um, <laughs> uh, and then we've got fill my ears with silver, okay, and uh, stick my legs in plaster. And uh, the overall image we're getting is the, the, like the three monkeys, see no evil. Hear no evil, speak no evil, which in Asian philosophy is very often taken as a positive thing. I don't, I don't, I'm not connected with anything bad. But in uh, Western thinking, it's usually negative. I, I don't listen, I don't listen, I, I pretend it's not happening. Okay, I pretend all the bad things are not there. So, uh, if we look at the poem in that way, we really start to get an insight into what it's all about. Because... Uh, the poet says he doesn't want to know the truth about all the terrible things in the world, and he pretends that they're only dropping peppermints and daisy chains, but we know that really it's bombs. But at the same time, uh, we know that the poem is addressed to whom it may concern, to, who, to people who might feel anxious. And if the truth hurts, why should we feel anxious about avoiding it? It would be natural. You know, say, let's, let's just avoid the truth. I mean, for God's sake, you know, why would we bother getting up going anywhere near it? But that's, you know, not quite the, the message of the poem. Uh, does he really prefer lies to truth, the poet, Adrian Mitchell, or is it that just a technique? And if it is just a technique, uh, what, what name would you give to that technique? Okay? And uh, 
I'm asking you here if there are any other techniques, and I've, I've talked to, I've talked about intertextuality, so I kind of gave that that one to you, and how the, how texts connect with other texts. Uh, talking about how he plays with genre, he uses like a nursery rhyme format to tell a very serious, to give a very serious message, which gives his message more punch, because by connecting it with a little dance song, you know, you do the hokey pokey. And uh, connecting it with nursery rhymes kind of is, an, again, an ironic mismatch. Irony is one of the basic techniques that we're going to be looking at in poetry. But it connects with all the other techniques as well. Okay. So basically, I'm going to give you another poem now and ask you to think about that, the other poem in those kinds of ways. All right? Okay, then. 